For hundreds of years, the Roman Empire had stretched from England to the Middle East, and the cheeses available in Rome came from all over, and in all shapes, sizes, and flavors. But in the 5th century, the western half of the empire began to disintegrate under the pressure of external invaders. What would happen to all those cheeses as the Roman era ended and the Middle Ages began? That was largely up to the lords of the manors and the monks of the monasteries. Hey there, cheese historians! I'm Julia, and this is Cheese History, a channel all about the origins, history, and impact of cheese. The role of manors and monasteries in the history of cheese making in Europe is huge, and this video is only a brief look at two things. First, how the manors and monasteries came about in the aftermath of the end of the Roman Empire in Western Europe, and second, how some of the different cheeses that arose during this period are connected to manors and monasteries. Manners and monasteries have their roots in the Roman Empire. Because it covered an immense amount of territory, a large army was needed to defend it from the surrounding, unconquered peoples. The Roman military acquired farmland wherever they stationed troops, and they used a combination of troop and local peasant labour to make cheese and other foods for the soldiers. Alongside military farms, there were estates, or villas, of the wealthy Roman upper classes. Initially, these were run by slave labour, but as the empire stopped expanding, there were less and less new slaves available. So small parcels of land were rented out to free people to make up for the slave labour shortage. As the centuries passed, tenant farmers faced increasing taxation from their Roman landlords, and particularly in the West, the empire was coming under pressure from the Germanic tribes, who steadily began to drive the Romans back towards the end of the 4th century AD. Under pressure from these external threats, the Roman estate holders required their tenants not only to pay rent, which was usually in the form of produce from their farms, but they also had to provide labour to support their lord's own farm. When the Germanic tribes took over these estates, they inherited this system, which they also found very appealing, as it would make the new Germanic lords wealthy, just as it had the Roman lords. This became the basis of the medieval manor system. The manor generally consisted of two components, a peasant side and a domain side. The peasant side was made up of free and unfree tenants, or serfs, who lived together as a village community on the estate and who possessed hereditary rights to small parcels of the lord's land. The demens side was the lord's personal farm, which might occupy from one quarter to as much as one half of the estate's total cultivated acreage. This manorial system varied in different parts of Europe and underwent numerous changes throughout the medieval period. By the 7th century, some of these manors had been gifted to various monastic orders of the Christian church and became monasteries. Many of these monasteries were part of the Benedictine and Cistercian orders, where the monks would live as self-sufficiently as possible, both serving their local communities and remaining separate from them. Initially, the monks did the labour of the monastery's land, but over time they increasingly devoted themselves to prayer and study. So an order of lay brothers was needed to provide the manual labour to work the land. These lay brothers were not full monks, and dedicated their lives to serving the monastic order through their labour. Both manors and monasteries had a huge role to play in the development of cheese in medieval Europe, mainly because they had control over much of the land used for raising the animals whose milk is most often turned into cheese, namely cattle, sheep and goats. So which cheeses can trace their development to the system? The development of cheeses connected to the manors and monasteries is a vast topic, and could well be a whole series of videos in its own right. What follows is very much a highlight reel of some of the cheeses and cheese-making methods that arose within these systems. Many of the tenant farmers of a manor would have had one or two cows, sheep or goats of their own that they would graze on common land and make cheese from the milk produced. As the amount of milk was limited by the number of animals, the amount of cheese made was also small. The cooler climate of parts of Europe did allow for milk to be stored overnight without spoiling, so milk from two days could be combined to make cheese. Paul Kinstead theorises that the cheeses produced 
would have used quite simple cheese making techniques because at the time women made cheese alongside all the other tasks of running their households. He speculates that the cheeses would have been quite small with a high moisture content but this also would have had the potential to create a huge range of different cheeses depending on how long the milk had been sitting before cheese making, the milk temperature when made into cheese, the amount of rennet used and how long it took the milk to coagulate. In France these techniques likely produced cheeses like Brie, Croton and Pont de Vec. At the Manus too, women were the primary cheesemakers, passing down their knowledge of cheesemaking from head dairy woman to under dairy woman over many centuries. Even in the monasteries, much of the cheesemaking was done by women with the assistance of the lay brothers. I'm going to come back to the topic of dairy women in a later episode, so do subscribe if you don't want to miss out on that. Wash grind cheeses have an orange skin on the outside and often smell like feet. In the medieval period, they were associated with monasteries, which could make larger quantities of cheese than the peasants, as they had access to larger herds of livestock. Münster may originate in the monasteries of this period. The history of Roquefort is also intertwined with monasteries, which helped it to gain the fame it enjoys today by promoting it to the upper classes of society. The techniques for making Roquefort may also have been passed on to monks in England, leading to the creation of Wensleydale, which is said to go back to the medieval monasteries of Yorkshire in England. The large aged cheeses of Italy like Parmesan and Grana Padano can likely also trace their origins back to monasteries in the Po Valley in northern Italy. As these cheeses require a lot of milk to create even a single cheese, monasteries would have been the ideal place to make them, as they had large herds and flocks. In the mountains of Europe, large, durable cheeses like Appenzeller, Gruyere, Emmental, Beaufort, Comte and Cantal were developed. They were made in small huts in the mountains when the herds and flocks of the manors and monasteries were taken up to graze in the summer months, and had to be robust enough to survive the trip back at the end of the season. Innovations like cutting curds, cooking them at higher temperatures, and milling the curds were used to create these cheeses. So from the monasteries and manors of the medieval period, a whole range of cheeses starts to emerge. Some of these cheeses are still being made today, while others have passed into the shadowy memories of cheese history. If there are any cheeses you would like to know the history of, let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching, and an especially huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for supporting the research that goes on behind these videos. See you around, historians. <laughs>